welcome. In the last two lectures, we re uh, reviewed uh, fundamentals of thermodynamics. So, now let us review fundamentals of fluid flow in this uh, particular lecture. So, the objectives of this uh, lesson are to present equations for conservation of mass, conservation of momentum and discuss uh, Bernoulli equation and its applications and discuss methods for evaluating friction pr pressure drop and minor losses. At the end of this lesson, uh, you should be able to state loss of conservation of mass and momentum, uh, apply these last two fluid flow problems in refrigeration and air conditioning and state Bernoulli equation and apply it to simple problems and uh, finally evaluate friction pressure drops and minor losses using suitable correlations and design data. Now, why do we have to study about fluid flow in refrigeration and air conditioning? As you have uh, probably seen, uh, in, a, in a typical refrigerant system or an air conditioning system, we will be handling a large number of fluids, for example, refrigerants, air, water, etcetera. These fluids will be flowing from one point to the other, that means fluid flow is involved in all these systems. Now, these uh, fluid flows are subjected to certain fundamental laws of fluid mechanics. So, in order to understand or in order to design uh, refrigeration and air conditioning systems, one must know the fundamentals of fluid mechanics or fluid flow. Uh, okay. So, that is what is uh, mentioned here in refrigeration and air conditioning uh, systems, various fluids such as air, water and refrigerants flow through pipes and ducts and the flow of these fluids is subjected to certain fundamental laws. And the subject of fluid mechanics deals with this subject, uh, with, with these aspects. Probably you have studied the fluid mechanics. So, it is uh, not possible to review the entire uh, subject here, but we will be presenting the basic uh, basics of uh, these things relevant to refrigeration and air conditioning. Now, uh, fluid flow in general can be compressible or incompressible. What do we mean by compressible flow? A compressible flow means the density of the fluid varies along the uh, flow direction. That means, basically um, uh, fluid density varies as the fluid flows. Uh, so, such flows are known as compressible flows. And in incompressible flow, the density remains constant. It does not vary. In most of the refrigeration and air conditioning applications, the fluid flows are ca can be assumed to be compressible. Why do we assume this? Because this will uh, simplify the problem considerably. So, most of the times we assume the flow to be incompressible uh, and the resulting mathematics will be simpler. However, uh, you cannot uh, just like that apply the assumption of incompressible flow everywhere. You have to see its validity. Uh, the assumption that uh, the flow is incompressible is valid as long as the velocity of fluid is much smaller than the local sonic velocity. That means, the velocity of the fluid should be smaller than the uh, velocity of sound or in other words, the Mach number should be less than 0.3 and as you know, the Mach number is the ratio of velocity of fluid divided by the sonic velocity. So, when the Mach number is less than 0.3, you can assume the flow to be incompressible and apply the suitable uh, laws. Now, to analyze fluid uh, flow problems, one has to consider three conservative equations. They are equations for conservation of mass, equation for conservation of momentum and uh, equation for conservation of energy. The conservation of energy is nothing but your first law of thermodynamics which we have discussed in, um, uh, the, in the review on thermodynamics. So, in this pr present lecture, we will be uh, discussing conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. Now, depending upon the approach, you can write these equations either in integral form or in differential form. That means, if you are taking control volume and apply these conservative uh, laws, you get integral form of equations. Or if you take a differential element inside the control volume and apply the conservative laws, you get the equation, governing equations in differential form. In the present lesson, I will just give you only the integral forms of conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. Now, this equation uh, shows the conservation of mass. As the name implies, uh, conservation of mass in simple terms is that ma mass can be neither created nor uh, destroyed. Uh, just like energy, you cannot create mass nor you can destroy mass. So, if you apply this uh, conservation of uh, mass to a control volume, uh, then you get a um, uh, equation of this form. As you can see in the in this equation, you have two terms. Uh, The first term here uh, is uh,
Okay. So, the first term here I am sorry is uh, the rate at which the mass of the control volume is varying with time that means time rate of change of mass of the control volume C V stands here for control volume uh, and the second term uh, is nothing but the net mass flux out of the control volume. So, the conservation of uh, mass when applied to a uh, control volume uh, kind of gives you two terms, two integral terms uh, since you are applying integral form. So, this first term uh, accounts for the rate at which the mass of the control volume is varying with time and the second term uh, accounts for the net mass flux out of the control volume. In this equation rho is the density, T is the time and uh, V is the velocity vector with reference to the control volume. Okay, and when the flow is steady that means when the flow does not vary with time this term will not be there. So, this uh, equation boils down to uh, conservation of mass for a steady flow situation. So, these equations are also known as continuity equation. So, uh, basically for steady flows we will be having this kind of an equation. Now, if you apply this uh, conservation of mass to a one dimensional steady flow through a duct. Let us say that we take a, an arbitrarily shaped duct and uh, let us say that this is a control volume and let the flow be steady and the flow be one, di one dimensional. Since the flow is steady no mass can be accumulated within the control volume that means the mass inside the control volume is constant that means whatever mass is entering that must leave the control volume okay that is what is uh, written here the rate at which mass is entering into the control volume is equal to the rate at which mass is leaving the control volume and the rate at which mass is entering the control volume can be written as a product of density rho 1 uh, cross sectional area a 1 at the inlet and velocity v 1 at the inlet. Similarly, at the outlet uh, you can write the mass flow rate uh, out of the control volume as rho 2 into a 2 into v 2. Oh, so this is the uh, simple uh, one dimensional steady flow equation when you apply it to a any duct. Now, if the density is uh, constant that means when rho 1 is rho 2 is rho then you get a conservation of mass equal uh, conservation of mass in a very simple form as a 1 v 1 is equal to a 2 v 2. Uh, Right. So, so, uh, so for uh, uh, steady incompressible flow uh, uh, for a one dimensional situation we get a conservation of mass equation as a 1 v 1 is equal to a 2 v 2. Now, when a 1 is greater than e 2 uh, a 2 then uh, the velocity v 1 should be less than v 2 this is what is known as a nozzle that means the velocity increases in the direction of flow as the cross sectional area reduces in the direction of flow this is what is known as nozzle and when the reverse case when a 1 is less than a 2 that means cross sectional area increases in the direction of flow then obviously according to the conservation of mass equation the velocity should reduce in the direction of uh, flow and this is what is known as a diffuser. Now, let us uh, look at the conservation of linear momentum. This is nothing but a mathematical expression for Newton's second law applied to a control volume and the general equation in integral form is like this. So, here uh, what we have is uh, dp by dt applied over a control volume this term. This term is nothing but rate of change of linear momentum of the control volume and this is equal to according to uh, Newton's second law is a net force acting on the control volume. This is nothing but the Newton's second law. And when we apply this to a control volume, we can write this uh, and introduce two terms. You have uh, one term uh, here, another term here. This first term accounts for the rate at which the momentum of the control volume is increasing with time. So, this term accounts for the rate of change of momentum of the control volume. And the second term accounts for the net momentum flux out of the control volume. So, in simple terms, uh, uh, the conservation of linear momentum says that uh, the net force acting on a system is equal to uh, sum of the rate at which the uh, momentum of the control volume is increasing plus net momentum flux out of the control volume. This is a vector equation that means you can write this equation for uh, different uh, direction for example, you can have linear momentum equation for x direction, linear momentum equation for y direction and z direction. So, this can be written in this form the net force acting on the control volume can be split into uh, sigma f s 
plus sigma fb where this is the sum uh, sum total of all the surface forces and this is the sum total of all body forces acting on the control volume so um, uh, finally the linear momentum equation boils down to sigma ss plus sigma fb is equal to the momentum uh, rate of momentum change of the control volume plus net momentum flux out of the control volume now for uh, steady state again uh, just like uh, conservation of mass for steady state you don't have the time terms so the um, uh, linear momentum equation for steady state becomes like this where uh, fs stands for the surface forces acting on the control surface and fb accounts for all the body forces acting on the control volume so the sum of these two forces is equal to net momentum flux out of the control volume and what are the typical surface forces the typical surface forces are pressure forces forces exerted by the physical boundary on the control surface etc okay and the most common body force is the gravity force acting on the mass inside the control volume now some of the applications of linear momentum equation are uh, force exerted by the fluid flow on nozzles bends in a pipe etc that means we want to find out what is the force exerted due to fluid fluid flow on nozzles and on the walls of the pipe and the bends etc then you have to apply the linear momentum equation and linear momentum equation is also applied uh, to find the motion of rockets and the calculation of motion of rockets and it's also applied for uh, in water hammers etc now let me give an example of uh, the application of linear momentum equation this is a very simple example uh, what we have here okay let me read the problem we have here a straight rigid 100 meter long uh, pipe through which water flows okay so water flows through this pipe and it has a diameter of 0.25 meter okay so diameter of the pipe is 0.25 meter it is rigid it is horizontal and it's 100 meter long and the water enters at certain pressure and it leaves at a pressure that is equal to atmospheric pressure that means here uh, you have p2 is equal to one atmosphere so basically the pipe discharges water into atmospheric pressure and at, at a given instant the flow rate is 0 0.1 mi 0 0.01 meter cube per second that means the flow rate of water through the pipe at a given instant is 0 0.01 meter cube per second but it increases at a rate of 0.1 meter cube per second square that means the flow rate through the uh, pipe is not constant but it increases with time and the rate at which the flow rate is increasing is equal to 0.1 meter cube per second and we can assume the water to be incompressible and we can also neglect frictional effects and take the density of water as 100 kg meter cube and what we have to find out is what should be the pressure at the inlet so that water under these conditions can flow through this pipe so first what we do is we apply the conservation of mass even though here the flow is not steady since we have uh, a rigid pipe a rigid horizontal pipe and the water is uh, incompressible the mass of the control volume cannot change because the volume of the control volume is constant so the amount of mass within the control volume is constant at any given instant so it doesn't change with time that means whatever mass enters into the control volume must leave the control volume okay so if you apply this um, then you get the conservation of mass equation as uh, a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2 that means uh, uh, and since the area is constant at every place if it's a uniform cross section uh, pipe the velocity remains constant throughout the pipe so this is uh, basically the conservation of mass now let us apply conservation of linear momentum as i have already shown conservation of linear momentum says that the net force acting on the uh, control volume so this is the control volume here i have shown the control volume by dash line the net force acting on the control volume consists of the sum uh, total of all surface forces plus sum total of all body forces and this is equal to the rate at which the momentum of the control volume is increasing plus net momentum flux out of the control volume that means this term is nothing but at any given instant what is the uh, difference between the momentum out of the control volume minus momentum uh, entering into the control volume that means momentum uh, at this point minus momentum at this point now the mass flow rate is constant at any given instant and the velocity at this point is same as velocity at this point so their net uh, momentum flux out of the uh, control volume is zero that means this term is 
0 for this particular problem. And uh, since we are neglecting uh, frictional effects and if you are, since the pipe is also horizontal, you, there are no body forces also, so this term is also not there. Then the surface forces in x direction is simply because of the pressure difference uh, at the inlet and the outlet. That means sigma fsx is nothing but p1a minus p2a that is equal to a into p1 minus p2 which is equal to pi d square by 4 into p1 minus p2. So this is the net force acting on the control volume in the x direction. So this should be equal to the rate at which the momentum of the control volume is changing. So the rate at which momentum of the control volume is changing is this and here uh, the small v is the momentum per unit area okay which uh, uh, I am sorry uh, momentum per unit area and this can also be written as it is some kind of velocity and this can be written as uh, volumetric flow rate divided by the cross sectional area that means V is equal to Q by A. So if you substitute uh, um, uh, Q by A for V you get this equation and uh, if you uh, integrate it over the entire volume this dV is the differential uh, volume and the total uh, volume of the uh, pipe is equal to uh, L into A. So this equation becomes d by dt q by a into rho l a and a and a get cancelled. So ultimately you have rho l dq by dt and in the problem it is given that dq by dt is 0.1 meter cube per second and rho is given as uh, 100 uh, kg per meter cube and length is 1 meter. So if you substitute this, uh, 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 these values here and then use uh, the equations 1 to 4 you get the answer of p1 is equal to 304.7 kilo Pascal absolute that means the pressure here should be 304.7 kilopascal so that the flow can take place. This is a very simple uh, application of uh, linear momentum to a pipe flow and uh, the same linear momentum principle is used in many other uh, applications and when we discuss uh, uh, the fluid flow aspects uh, through represent pipes and uh, you know, ducts we will discuss these uh, issues. So similar to linear momentum, we can also write a conservative equation for moment of momentum or angular momentum. This equation is known as moment of momentum equation and this states that the net moment applied to a system is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum of the system. This is known as the conservation of angular momentum and this is very widely used uh, in hydraulic machines such as pumps, turbines, com uh, centrifugal compressors, etc. Now let us look at one of the very important equations called Bernoulli's equation. Uh, this equation is applied in a wide variety of uh, fluid flow related problems and in uh, it can be derived either from the momentum equation or from the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, that means either you can use the momentum equation or basically the Euler's equation or you can also derive the same equation from first law of thermodynamics or conservation of energy equation. And this equation in simple terms relates uh, pressure, velocity and elevation along a streamline or pressure, velocity and elevation between any two points in the flow field. Now I am sure that you have studied uh, st about streamlines in fluid mechanics but let me uh, just uh, give the definition of streamlines. Streamlines are the lines drawn through the flow field in such a manner that the velocity vector of the fluid at each and every point on the streamline is tangent to the streamline at that instant. That means streamlines are lines drawn through the flow field. If you take a point on the streamline and draw a tangent that gives the direction of the velocity of the fluid at that point. So this is the basic definition of a streamline. Now the concept of streamline is very useful in describing a flow field in terms of speed and direction of flow. If you want to describe a flow field as you know that it is a vector field you have to specify both the magnitude and direction. So the concept of streamline is very useful for uh, such a flow field uh, dis description and it can be shown from continuity equation that when the streamlines are very close to each other that means the uh, speed of flow is high that means or in other words speed of flow is inversely proportional to the spacing between streamlines. Now Bernoulli equation is applicable along a streamline under the assumptions of steady flow one dimensional flow, incompressible flow and inviscid flow. So what do we mean by steady flow? As you know steady flow means uh, it does not, the flow does not vary with time. So whenever you have a fluid flow situation which do not vary with time, you call that flow as steady flow. Uh, and what do we mean by one dimensional flow? One dimensional flow means properties vary only in 
one dimension. Uh, they are in the other two dimension, they remain constant. That means, at any cross section, uh, the fluid properties remain constant. If you are talking about um, uh, one dimensional uh, flow in y, x direction, that means, in y and z direction, there are no variations in the uh, fluid properties at any x. So, this is the meaning of one dimensional. And what do we mean by inviscid? Inviscid means the fluid should not have any viscosity. That means, this is basically apply, uh, applicable to ideal fluids because all real fluids have viscosity. So, the moment you say that it is applicable to inviscid flow, that means it is applicable to ideal fluids. And finally, incompressible. Incompressible as we have seen means that the density does not vary uh, along the fluid flow direction. So, under these uh, assumptions, you can apply Bernoulli's equation to any two points on a streamline. And the Bernoulli's equation is also applicable to any two points of the flow field when the flow is uh, irrotational in addition to one dimensional, inviscid, steady and incompressible. What it means is, uh, if the flow is irrotational in addition to uh, steady, incompressible and inviscid, then you can also apply Bernoulli equation to any two points in the flow field, it not necessarily on the same streamline. What do we mean by irrotational flow? Irrotational flow means the fluid particles uh, do not undergo net rotation. So, that is what is known as uh, an ir irrotational flow. Now, the Bernoulli equation is uh, given by this expression. Uh, you can write it in different forms. For example, if you write it in the uh, form of head, that means in the form of pressure head, velocity head, static head and total head, you get this kind of a an expression. Here, this term as you can see is known as pressure head and this term is known as velocity head and this term is known as static head and here p is the static pressure, rho is the density and g is the acceleration due to gravity and v is the velocity of the fluid and z is the elevation with reference to a datum. So, basically what the Bernoulli equation written in terms of the head says that the pressure head plus velocity head plus static head between any two points in the flow field or between any two points on a, a streamline is, is constant, that means the total head is constant. You can also write this equation in terms of pressures, that means you can write this in terms of pressures as static pressure P, velocity pressure uh, rho v square by 2 and pressure due to datum. So, the Bernoulli equation when written for in terms of pressure states that um, the static pressure plus velocity pressure plus uh, pressure due to datum called as total pressure remains constant under the uh, assumption stated earlier. Now, between any two points in the flow field, you can write uh, Bernoulli equation in this form. For example, I am writing this between point 1 and 2. Uh, then uh, the uh, summation of uh, static head plus velocity head plus uh, head due to datum is equal to the static head plus velocity head plus datum head at point 2. And as I was mentioning, for real fluids, uh, the flow is uh, not inviscid, that means uh, viscous effects are there in re real fluid. So, you can modify uh, Bernoulli's equation and uh, the by including what is known as a head loss term. So, this is known as uh, modified Bernoulli equation, that means it is nothing but Bernoulli equation with uh, provision for viscosity by including a uh, head loss term. So, in this expression all these terms are known to you, one additional term is HL which is called as head loss. So, now let me show the a pressure variation, let us apply the Bernoulli equation to a pipe flow and let us see how the pressures are varying. Let us what we have here is a, um, a uniform cross section pipe through which a fluid is flowing okay? and we would like to plot uh, different pressures. Now, let us uh, for the, for, to start with, let us assume that the flow is, uh, flow is inviscid, that means the fluid does not have any viscosity. Since the uh, cross section area is same here, that means area at any point is same. So, if you apply continuity equation at any point V is constant. So, velocity does not change along the uh, length. Since um, uh, velocity pressure is equal to rho V square by 2 and rho is constant here, uh, the velocity pressure also will remain constant because V is constant. So, you, if you are plotting pressure, different pressures versus length, you find that for the velocity pressure you get a horizontal line. Okay, so, this is a line for velocity pressure and uh, if the flu fluid is ideal, then the static pressure also remains same. So, this is the static pressure line for the ideal fluid. Since the total pressure is summation of uh, velocity pressure plus static pressure, the total pressure line is also 
uh, horizontal. So, uh, total pressure at any point is equal to velocity pressure plus static pressure and it remains constant throughout the length. So, this is the application of Bernoulli's uh, law to an ideal fluid. Now, what is the effect uh, if viscosity is non-zero? That means, uh, if the fluid is uh, uh, viscid or it has finite viscosity. Uh, for uh, viscous flow, the velocity pressure still remains same because uh, from the continuity equation, velocity at any point should remain same. Okay. So, this uh, horizontal line applies to both uh, inviscid as well as viscous flows. So, velocity pressure remains horizontal only. Then what happens to the static pressure? Static pressure continuously reduces in the direction of flow because of the viscous effects. That means, there is a loss of static head uh, due to viscosity. So, you see the uh, a sloped dashed line for viscous flow. Okay. So, the total pressure is nothing but the summation of uh, static pressure uh, plus velocity pressure. So, and the velocity pressure is remaining constant and static pressure is reducing. So, the total pressure also reduces in a real flow and this uh, difference between the total pressure at the inlet minus total pressure at the outlet is nothing but your head loss. So, this is the application of uh, a Bernoulli phi equation to a pipe flow. Now, let us say that we would like to maintain the same uh, pressure uh, at the inlet and as well as the outlet and the flow is inviscid. That means, we want to maintain uh, P1 should be same as P2 and similarly static pressure at the inlet should be same as static pressure at the outlet, but the fluid is uh, viscid that means, it has viscosity. Then how do we ensure this? So, whenever you have viscous flows and if you want to have uh, same pressures at the inlet or outlet or if the inlet pressures are greater than uh, the outlet pressures, uh, then what we have to do is we have to use some kind of a pump or a uh, fan. For example, if I am using a pump here or a fan here, okay, then it is possible to maintain the same uh, static pressures uh, and the total pressure at the inlet and outlet. What happens when you have uh, when you are putting a pump. When you are uh, keeping a pump or a fan in the pipe flow, the velocity pressure does not change because uh, it, uh, the fan or pump does not increase the mass flow rate. So, velocity pressure remains same, but it increases the static pressure because it adds energy to the fluid. So, at the point where you have uh, added the pump, the static pressure increases. Okay. Since the static pressure increases, the velocity pressure also increases. So, you have uh, the modified uh, pressure lines with the addition of pump or fan inside the fluid circuit. Now, that is what is uh, shown in this slide. Uh, this is a modified uh, Bernoulli equation with friction and a fan uh, or pump and I have shown here an arbitrary uh, cross section. That means, uh, uh, cross section area need not be constant and the fluid enters here and fluid leaves here and this is the fan or a pump. So, what is the modified Bernoulli equation for this kind of a situation? This is the modified Bernoulli equation, only the difference is this. So, this is nothing but the head gain due to the presence of the fan. If uh, P 1 is equal to um, uh, P 1 by rho z is equal to P 2 by rho z and V 1 square by 2 g is equal to V 2 square by 2 z and Z 1 is equal to Z 2, then these terms get cancelled out and you have uh, H P is equal to H loss. That means, the head gain due to the fan should be sufficient to overcome the head loss due to friction. Now, what is the power required to drive the fan or pump under uh, the case discussed just now? So, this equation gives what is the power requirement uh, when you are using a fan or a pump. Uh, this again is derived uh, by using uh, Bernoulli's equation and what we have here this m dot is nothing but the mass flow rate of the fluid uh, and uh, this is the head loss and this is the static pressure at the outlet, static pressure at the inlet, V 2 square minus V 1 square is the difference uh, divided by 2 is the difference in velocity pressures at the outlet and inlet and this is the difference in the datum heads. And here uh, eta fan is the efficiency of the fan, that means if the fan has some inefficiency then you have to take that into account. So, this expression gives you the uh, fan power required or pump power required. So, you can uh, by applying uh, Bernoulli's equation, you can find out what should be the uh, motor capacity to drive the fan or pump. Now, let us apply this Bernoulli equation 
द वेरी सिंपल केस सो दिस इज एन एप्लीकेशन ऑफ बर्नोली इक्वेशन टू ए वेंचुरी नो वॉट इज ए वेंचुरी वेंचुरी इज ए डिवाइस फॉर मेजरिंग फ्लो रेट बेसिकली नॉर्मल इट इज यूज फॉर मेजरिंग एयर फ्लो रेट और वॉटर फ्लो रेट सो एज यू कैन सी इन द फिगर इट कंसिस्ट ऑफ ए स्ट्रेट पोर्शन देन ए कन्वर्जिंग पोर्शन एंड ए gradually diverging portion so this is your diverging uh, diverging portion this is a converging and where the diverging and converging portions meet we call it uh, that portion as the throat the throat of the uh, venturi and here uh, this is the inlet to the converging portion is uh, point 1 and the throat portion is point 2 and uh, the venturi has a manometer here and uh, one end of the manometer is con uh, connected to the inlet to the co converging section that means point 1 and the other end of the manometer is con uh, is connected to the uh, throat portion that means point 2 and this manometer is filled with some manometric liquid so basically the air flows through the manometer and because of the air flow there will be some pressure difference in the manometer that means there will be a manometric head here and from the characteristics of the venturi and from the ma by measuring the manometric head you can calculate the air flow by applying or bernoulli equation so now let us look at the problem statement uh it is given here that uh, the areas cross section areas a1 and a2 are 0.5 meter square and 0.4 meter square that means area at this point 1 is 0.5 meter square and area at point 2 is 0.4 meter square and the density of air is 1.12 kg per meter cube and manometric fluid used here is water and it has a density of 1000 1000 kg per meter cube and the measurements show that the manometric head is 20 mm and it's also given that acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meter per second square and we can neglect all frictional effect that means we'll be applying the uh, original bernoulli equation because we are assuming the fluid to be incompressible steady uh, irrotational and uh, in we feed so frictional effects need not be considered so if you apply uh, bernoulli equation let's see what uh, happens first um, uh, what is the okay what is the uh, required output we have to find out what is the mass flow rate for this venturi which shows a manometric head of 20 mm so the equations for uh, mass flow rate is uh, rho av mass flow rate at any point is equal to rho into cross section area at that point and velocity at that point so you can write uh, this expression for mass flow rate and from continuity equation uh, nothing but uh, conservation of mass equation a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2 because uh, we are assuming the fluid to be incompressible so rho a at any point is constant so from this equation you get that a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2 or velocity at the point 2 that means velocity at the throat can be expressed in terms of the areas uh, cross section areas at the throat and at the inlet to the converging section and inter and the velocity at the Uh, inlet to the converging section so v2 is equal to a1 by a2 into v1 now let us apply bernoulli equation uh, if you are applying the bernoulli equation you can uh, slightly write it in a different uh, form or uh, datum head is uh, change in datum head is uh, zero so we can write the bernoulli equation in this form p1 minus p2 is equal to rho a into v2 square minus v1 square by 2 and p1 minus p2 is nothing but the uh pressure difference between the point 1 and 2 which can be obtained from the manometer reading as rho g h where rho w here is the density of the water g is the acceleration due to gravity and h is the manometric head so if you uh, uh, use the input data and these four equations uh, you can you will find that the mass flow rate of air is equal to 11.18 kg per second so this is one very useful uh, application of bernoulli equation to a venturi meter there are many other applications of bernoulli uh, equation as i mentioned it is one of the most useful equations uh, and you find its applications particularly in air conditioning uh, or duct design and in refrigerant piping design etc we will be using this equation repeatedly but uh, you must keep uh, certain things in mind even the bernoulli equation is very useful you must be aware of the assumptions under which the bernoulli equation is valid Uh, for example bernoulli equation is not valid when you have a duct where there is a sudden expansion when there is a when uh, there is sudden expansion what happens is uh, the fluid gets separated that means there will be uh, separation of fluid and uh, the flow no longer remains one dimensional 
Uh, so you cannot apply Bernoulli equation because uh, you remember that Bernoulli equation is a scalar equation and it is applicable to one dimensional flows. So whenever you have a two dimensional, three dimensional effects, you cannot apply Bernoulli equation number one. And second thing is uh, if you have a uh, fluid flow where there is a lot of heat transfer as the fluid flows through the duct then also you cannot apply Bernoulli equation. Then because what happens when there is a large amount of uh, heat transfer, then the density may not remain constant as the fluid is flowing through the conduit. That means the assumption of incompressible flow uh, will, be, will not be valid. So you cannot again apply the simple Bernoulli equation that we have discussed here. So when you are applying Bernoulli equation, first make sure that uh, the uh, assumptions or the conditions are met uh, and then apply the Bernoulli equation. Of course, Bernoulli equations are also have been developed for unsteady flows and also for uh, compressible flows, but we will not be discussing those issues and these will be discussed in applied fluid mechanics courses. Right. Now let us uh, look at the evaluation of uh, pressure loss during uh, fluid flow. We have seen that uh, Generally, in uh, one of the most uh, common problems or common requirements in the design of an air conditioning duct or in the design of a, a refrigerant piping or in a chilled water piping is to find the capacity of the motor or capacity of the pump, uh, what should be the uh, power consumption or what is the power consumption of the pump so that you can select a suitable motor for the pump or the fan. So you have seen from the modified Bernoulli equation. Uh, in the presence of uh, viscous effects uh, and a fan that the uh, pump power depends upon the mass flow rate and it, it depends upon the uh, inlet and outlet pressures, velocities and datum heads and the friction losses that means the head loss. So if you want to find out uh, what is the power requirement you must know what is the head loss. Uh, okay, and normally in any, any given problem the mass flow rates is an input and the pressures and velocities are also are also input. So if you know the head loss, then you can find out the uh, power input. So a key problem here is to find out what is the pressure drop as the fluid flows through uh, a conduit. Now the loss in pressure is due to fluid friction and turbulence, change in fluid flow cross section area and abrupt change in flu fluid flow direction. That means uh, uh, the fluid uh, undergoes pressure loss due to these three effects, uh, friction and turbulence, uh, change in uh, fluid flow cross-sectional area and abrupt change in fluid flow direction. A pressure loss due to friction and turbulence is known as frictional pressure drop and uh, pressure drop uh, due to change in cross-sectional area and abrupt change in fluid flow direction is known as minor loss. That means frictional losses, all losses due to friction and turbulence are known as uh, frictional pressure drops and uh, losses due to change in cross section area and change in direction are known as ma minor losses. Sometimes the name minor losses uh, could be a misnomer because in some situations the minor losses can be much more than the frictional pressure drops. So you have to uh, keep it in mind and you should not neglect the minor losses thinking that they are minor. Now the frictional pressure drop. Uh, the frictional pressure drop is given by Darcy Weisbach uh, equation uh, for internal flows and it is given as uh, delta Pf is equal to F L by D into rho V square by 2. This is the frictional pressure drop uh, and here L is the length of the pipe or tube or the duct and D is the internal diameter if it is a circular pipe or tube or as a, by an equivalent hydraulic uh, diameter if the cross section is non-circular. And rho as you know is the density and V is the velocity. So if you know the uh, density, velocity, length, diameter and uh, this factor, then you can find out the uh, frictional pressure drops. Now what is this factor F? F factor F is known as Darcy friction factor. It is a non-dimensional uh, uh, factor and it depends upon Reynolds number and relative roughness of the internal surface. Now what is Reynolds number? I am sure that again you studied uh, about Reynolds number in your uh, course on fluid mechanics, but let me just uh, uh, give it uh, for the sake of completion. Reynolds number is a dimensionless number that quantitatively relates the viscous and inertial forces and whose value determines the transition from laminar to turbulent flow. So basically you have to keep it in mind that this is a dimensionless number and it relates viscous and inertial forces. 
and its value determines whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. We will see a little later what is the mean by laminar or turbulent flow. And mathematically Reynolds number is expressed as Re is equal to rho V d by mu where rho is the density, V is the fluid velocity and d is a length, uh, um, length scale parameter. If it is a tube or circular tube or pipe, d is the diameter. If it is a non-circular tube or pipe, d can be, d could be a hydraulic uh, diameter. And if it is a um, flat external flow, that means the flow is taking place over a flat plate or some, something like that, then d can be the length. And uh, mu here is the uh, dynamic viscosity. So Reynolds number is nothing but rho v d by mu. And uh, um, uh, for internal flows, it is observed that the flow will be laminar if Reynolds number is less than 2300 and the flow becomes turbulent if the Reynolds number increases uh, beyond 2300. Now this, uh, uh, this is only a very rough criteria. Strictly speaking, uh, you really do not have a sudden transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow. That means basically we will see, I uh, will show you the boundary layer development. Generally you have uh, at low Reynolds numbers, you have laminar flow and at a certain critical Reynolds number, there will be transition. So that means the flow uh, uh, changes from laminar to a transition flow and uh, the transition flow continues to a certain extent and beyond certain Reynolds number, the flow becomes uh, turbulent. That means you have laminar flow, transition uh, regime and turbulent regime. But for most of the practical purposes and most of the engineering calculations, we assume that when the Reynolds number, particularly for internal flows, if it is less than 2300, we take that the flow is laminar and if it exceeds uh, 2300, we assume that the flow is turbulent. Uh, but in advanced uh, heat transfer and fluid mechanics problems, the transition region is also concerned. But as far as our refrigeration and air conditioning calculations are concerned, you may take the transition Reynolds number or critical Reynolds number as 2300 for internal flows. One more thing uh, is that uh, it is possible by carefully controlling the um, uh, fluid flow conditions and all to extend the critical Reynolds number. That means you can have laminar flow even at Reynolds number as high as uh, say 10,000 or 20,000 under carefully controlled conditions. So this uh, critical Reynolds number and the number 2300 is a rough guideline. It is not a fixed uh, number or anything. So we have, uh, I have mentioned that the Darcy friction factor is a function of Reynolds number and relative roughness of the internal surface. So let us look at uh, a few cases for, for fully developed laminar flow. The Darcy friction factor is given by 64 divided by the Reynolds number. That means for fully developed laminar flow, the friction factor is independent of the roughness of the surface. So it is only a function of the Reynolds number. And for fully developed turbulent flow, the correlation given here is known as Colebrook and White correlation. This is a Colebrook and White correlation and it relates the friction factor with the roughness and the Reynolds number. This roughness has the same dimensions as the length scale or uh, the, that means the diameter. So this equation is uh, a very popular equation and it is known as Colebrook and White equation for the fully developed turbulent flow. One thing you can notice here is that uh, to, solve, to use this equation, you have to use an iterative procedure because F occurs uh, both on the left hand side as well as on the right hand side. So you have to uh, use a trial and error uh, iterative method to find out F. Now, Ashray suggests another uh, correlation, very useful correlation and uh, explicit correlation. First, Ashray suggests, uh, Ashray um, uh, defines a parameter F1. F1 is given as 0 0.11 into Kf by D plus 0 0.68 divided by Reynolds number. So, this factor is defined first and if this factor is less than 0 0.018, then F1 is equal to friction factor F. And if the factor is le less than 0 0.018, then friction factor is given by this equation. That means first you have to find out the factor F1 from the roughness and from the Reynolds number and see whether the factor is greater than or equal to 0 0.018 or it is less than uh, 0 0.018. If it is greater than or equal to 0 0.018, then F1 is nothing but F. If it is less than 0 0.018, you have to make a correction and F is equal to 0.85 F1 plus 0.018. 0.0028. So, this is a very useful equation suggested by 
आश्रय now i was uh, talking about laminar flow and uh, turbulent flow let me just uh, uh, explain uh, laminar and turbulent uh, flow and what do we mean by fully developed flow let us say that we have a, a flat plate a flat plate over which fluid is flowing so at this point you have what is known as a free stream uh, and uh, this fluid comes in contact with uh, a solid surface uh, at this point let us say that at this point x is 0. So, at this point uh, the fluid comes in contact with the solid once the fluid comes in contact with the solid what happens let us uh, consider uh, real fluids that means let us say that the fluids have finite viscosity as you know viscosity is one of the transport properties of the fluid and when a real fluid comes in contact with a let us say a stationary surface then the velocity of the fluid uh, adjacent to the stationary surface will be same as that of the stationary surface that means uh, the velocity uh, next to the solid surface will be same as the solid surface temperature uh, solid surface velocity and if the solid surface is stationary solid surface uh, velocity is 0 that means the fluid layer adjacent to the um, uh, solid surface will be uh, having a 0 velocity that means velocity at this point will be 0. Okay, so, suddenly the velocity changes from the free stream velocity to 0 velocity on the surface. When the velocity is 0, you have to satisfy the uh, continuity equation that means uh, the, a velocity profile uh, will develop. The velocity profile will develop because of viscous effects. Uh, since the velocity here is uh, 0, the velocity uh, fluid layer uh, on the surface will try to uh, hold the fluid layer adjacent to it that means it will try to decelerate the fluid that is adjacent to the, the layer and the, that layer will try to decelerate uh, the um, fluid that is flowing adjacent to it. So, like that a velocity gradient develops uh, and uh, that is what is shown here. So, gradually velocity gradient develops and at a certain point the velocity will be same as the uh, a free stream velocity again let us say that this is the free stream velocity this is free stream on the plate and this is the free stream velocity on the plate let us say that u infinity on the plate. Okay. So, what basically has happened is because of the presence of the solid surface uh, a velocity gradient has developed in this reason and uh, the reason in which the velocity varies from 0 to the free stream velocity is known as a boundary layer that means this is known as a boundary layer. So, because of the presence of a surface and because of the viscous effects a boundary layer develops whenever the fluid comes in contact with a solid surface. Okay. Now, um, initially this boundary layer will be laminar. So, what do you mean by laminar? Laminar flow uh, means uh, the fluid uh, particles will be flowing in layers or in lamina and uh, any mixing is only due to molecular uh, motion that means in laminar flow. Uh, mixing is uh, mixing between uh, um, uh, fluid layers is purely because of molecular motion and uh, there is no bulk mixing. Such a flow is called as laminar flow and for uh, laminar flow appears very smooth and it is steady uh, and a typical example of laminar flow is uh, the flow of let us say a thick liquid like honey uh, from a bottle that means if you take a honey bottle and uh, pour, uh, pour it uh, then uh, uh, the honey comes out in a laminar uh, um, uh, manner. Uh, okay. Uh, and laminar flow is generally encountered uh, when the Reynolds number is small. So, at low Reynolds number you generally have laminar flow. So, in this particular case uh, to start with we have laminar region and for this particular case we define Reynolds number in terms of the length scale that means the local Reynolds number is defined as divided by mu. Okay. So, here uh, this length scale is uh, x or the distance from the leading edge. So, as the distance from the leading edge uh, increases Reynolds number increases that means Reynolds number increases in this direction. So, uh, to start with we have a laminar region where the Reynolds number is small and as I said at certain uh, uh, critical Reynolds number the flow changes from laminar to transition. So, you have a transition regime here. So, transition regime continues to certain extent and again at certain point uh, flow transition takes place to turbulent region. So, you have uh, 
uh, turbulent flow. So, you to start with you have laminar region, you have a transition region and a turbulent region. What happens in a turbulent region? In a turbulent region, uh, you have a molecular motion and superimposed on that molecular motion is a bulk mixing of fluid particles because of eddies. That means, in turbulent flow eddies uh, form and these eddies uh, lead to uh, mixing on a bulk scale, that means on a macroscopic scale. So, you have mixing due to uh, molecular motion as well as mixing due to eddies. So, this is the characteristic of a turbulent uh, flow. And uh, unlike uh, laminar flow, turbulent flow is uh, highly unsteady. Uh, and a typical example of a turbulent flow is let us say that you have a water tap and you have uh, opened the tap fully then water uh, comes out in a very uh, haphazard and random uh, irregular manner and that is an example of uh, turbulent flow. And you slowly uh, close the water tap, then uh, water becomes more and more regular and at very low flow rates, uh, the water becomes flow becomes very smooth. That means, you have a laminar uh, region. So, this is how you can uh, change the laminar region to turbulent region by changing the velocity in this case or Reynolds number. So, but this is the <coughs> Um, uh, in, in short the physics uh, behind uh, laminar and turbulent flows and as I said the uh, value of Reynolds number decides whether the flow is uh, laminar or turbulent and for internal flows I mentioned that if the Reynolds number is less than 2300 you have uh, laminar flow and if it is uh, greater than 2300 you may consider that as turbulent flow. This is only a guideline and for uh, fluid flow over flat plate that means the example that I have shown just now. Oh, the critical Reynolds number is totally different. So, in for uh, flow over horizontal plate, the flow will be laminar as long as the Reynolds number is less than 5 into 10 to the power of 5. This is again a guideline. So, as long as uh, Reynolds number is less than 5 into 10 to the power of 5, we assume the flow to be uh, laminar. And if exceeds, if it exceeds uh, 5 into 10 to the power of 5, we assume the flow to be turbulent. So, now let us look at uh, the determination of uh, minor losses. As I mentioned, uh, minor losses are due to change in uh, cross section uh, and also due to ch change in the direction. Normally, when the cross section uh, increases gradually or reduces gradually, there will not be uh, any significant losses. But when the cross section increases uh, uh, steeply, then there will be boundary layer separation and uh, there will be losses. Uh, so, these losses uh, are known as minor losses. In addition to that, whenever there is a change in uh, uh, flow direction, uh, basically an abrupt change. Again, if the change takes place gradually, then the losses are negligible. But if the change is uh, abrupt, for example, you have a sudden uh, elbow, then there is a sudden change in the direction, then you will have again pressure losses. So, the uh, losses due to change in direction and change in cross section area are clubbed together and they are known as minor losses. So, generally the minor losses are uh, given as uh, delta p m, this is the sum total of uh, minor losses and the, that is equal to k a factor k into rho v square by 2. That means, the minor losses are always proportional to the velocity pressure term. Okay. And this uh, factor k uh, has to be determined experimentally and it will be different for different types of valves, joints, fittings, bends, etcetera. And generally the values of k for different uh, fittings, valves, etcetera are available uh, in standard literature. So, what we have to do is if you want to find out what is the minor loss. For example, you have a bend and you would like to find out what is the pressure loss due to bend. Then first you have to find out what is the uh, velocity pressure. That means, you have to find out the velocity and you have to find out the term rho v square by 2 and multiply that into the factor k. So, this factor k has to be obtained from a published data for that particular bend or valve or fitting. So, this is generally the procedure for calculating minor losses. So, finally, the total head loss is nothing but the frictional loss plus minor loss. So, we have to find out these two from that you have to find out the uh, power required for a fan or pump which is a typical uh, problem in uh, any uh, fluid flow related issue uh, problems in refrigeration and air conditioning. Now, let us uh, conclude uh, today's lecture. In uh, today's lecture, uh, we have uh, reviewed the fundamentals of fluid flow relevant to refrigeration and air conditioning and we have presented mathematical equations for conservation of mass and momentum. 
conservation of mass is also known as uh, equation for conservation of mass is also known as continuity equation both are same uh, and we have also presented uh, and discussed Bernoulli equation in its original form and also modified Bernoulli equation uh, for viscous flows and when a fan or pump is used in the uh, fluid flow conduit. Then we have uh, presented methods for evaluating friction losses and minor losses uh, with typical correlations for friction coefficients. Uh, let me uh, mention here that uh, the correlations shown here for friction factor uh, are uh, uh, typical correlation that means there are a large number of correlations for different uh, fluid flow situations and these correlations are applicable generally they are empirical so they are applicable for only that particular uh, condition that means uh, every correlation has a range of application. So, when you are applying uh, empirical correlations you must see what is its uh, range of applicability and make sure that your uh, problem falls into that range of applicability only then apply the uh, uh, correlation. And there are a large number of correlations available for uh, friction factors for different types of flows. So, depending upon the a particular uh, situation we have to select a suitable correlation then find the friction factor. Similarly, the minor losses we have to find out the factor k depending upon the uh, specific uh, problem and from these two we have to find out the uh, total head loss. So, these aspects have been discussed here and uh, we will be applying these uh, uh, two refrigeration air conditioning in a later chapter. Okay, thank you. Thank you.